In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 24, the proverb writer says, When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down, and your sleep will be sweet. And the other day, as I was trying to come up with a lesson to do for the first Sunday of the month, where we always look at a particular song title, I went in and I asked Alice, I said, Alice, I don't have any and I can't think of any that I want to do. What do you think? And she said, how about now the day is over? And I said, well, I'll go see what information I can find and what we can come up with. And sure enough, there was plenty of information on this song. So I guess that's my appeal. If there are some songs that you would like to see us look at, write them on a piece of paper and give it to me so I can have it. Don't come telling me, otherwise... I might forget. I have a habit of forgetting things sometimes. But the song, Now the Day is Over. What a beautiful song it is in which what we see, it, 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 it asks God's blessings upon us as we come to the close of the day, we lie down to go to sleep. Now the day is over. Typically, this song is used as a closing hymn at the end of an evening worship service. I found it interesting as I was looking at this, the writer of our song that wrote the text is Sabine Barry Gould, and he was one who wrote many different songs, but somehow this seems to be the one that has stuck out. As a matter of fact, I don't know of a songbook that I've ever seen in the Church of Christ that this song has not been included. That tells you something about the writer of this song and the message that we hope to see that it portrays. The tune composed by Joseph Bambi uh, in about 1886 or somewhere in that neighborhood. And as you look and you think about this song, at eight, I say 1886, 1865, what was real interesting as I was looking at this song was that originally it had eight different stanzas. And so I started thinking to myself, why would editors of songbooks leave stanzas out of a song? And look at our songbook. How many did we sing tonight? Three. Three. The most that I found in any songbook that are, that are in my office the most I found in the paperless hymnal was five. Why do songwriters leave verses out? It is because of personal preference for the most part. Sometimes an editor will leave a song out because the verse may have something unscriptural in it, which I call, and I think is a good thing. But as I read the eight stanzas of this song, I couldn't find any of that. But so what I want to do tonight is I want to look at three of the verses. I know two of them at least are in our book, and the other one I can't remember if it was in the book or not. So bear with me as we, as we look at this. Stanza number one that we sang tonight, very, simple, very simply, is an approach to God through nature. As you look at the words of the first verse, when the day is over, will it not be a time for us to lie down and to sleep? Isn't it a time for us when we can physically relax and rest? Now, someone here, and I'm not going to mention any names, just today asked me if I got my nap out. Actually, the individual said, did you get your beauty rest? And I replied, I didn't have time to latch into a coma because there's not going to be much I can do to become more beautiful as I sleep, okay? But I do need my rest. And I know several of you today, when you went home from services this morning after you ate, I know exactly what you did. You sat in your chair or you laid on the couch, and some of you may have got into bed, and you took a little bit of time to rest. And that's a period of refreshing, is it not? But when is it the best time to get that rest that your body needs to be able to recover? 
Isn't it through the sleep of the night? Notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 4 and verse 8. He says there, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. It is the Lord that gives us the safety of the night. But secondly, when you see in the first stanza, you will see that it was God Himself who created who created and divided the day and the night. He's the one who gave us the period of time where we had sunlight and where we had darkness. We go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5. God called the day, or the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the morning and the evening what, were the first day. It is God who gave us this ability to know that the day is over and night has fallen. And then that last phrase in the first verse, that which steals across the evening sky. As I look at that and as I see what that might mean to me, I can't help but to think that the shadows of the evening are those things which declare the handiwork of God. When you look out in an evening, and, and for those of you city folks, or even for, for me, it is hard to see the beauty of God's creation at night when you live in the city. Because of all the unnatural light that exists. But if we were to go out to Chip's house, or Galen's house, out in the middle of nowhere... Someone asked me how to get to Chip's house one time, and I said, you can't get there. You'll get lost. <laughs> but if you go out, and you were able just to go out and there be no light, would you not be able to see the handiwork of God declared to the night? And that's what the psalmist says in Psalm 119. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Think about what you see when you look into the night sky. And those are the shadows that steal the evening sky. But in the second verse this evening, and, and this is the one that, that we did not sing, but I think it was one to me that was most <coughs> important. It is because in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this verse, it is a call of a tired body for safe, refreshing rest. And yes, I realize it kind of goes hand in hand with verse 1. But I want us to think about our life. How many of us at some point in life have become so weary or so tired because of all of the activities that we try to do in a day? We just work ourselves to a frenzy. And so we look forward to that period of rest. And it may be that you work yourself in a physical way, and that will tire you out. But brother, what about when you work yourself in a mental way? When you work your mind, do you not get wore out when you do that too? You see, and when you combine the physical and the mental together, what you will see is you will have a good rest. Notice what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 30. He says, even the youths shall faint and be weary. I thought about what that verse was saying. And then I thought about our children. I think about our young children. I think about the You know, children, what do they do? They go, they go, they go, they go. And the next thing you know, you don't hear them. And where are they? Aren't they curled up in a corner somewhere, sound asleep? You see, they grow weary. They need their rest, just as, as we as adults, as we need our rest. But he goes on in the verse and says, And the young men shall utterly fall. We're going to get to a point where we need rest. And it is time to rest when the day is over. But God has promised us that our sleep will be good. He has promised us that He will give us 
that beloved sleep. The verse we read in Proverbs chapter 3. Your sleep shall be sweet. But notice what he says in Psalm 127 in verse 2. He said, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. What benefit does it do to get up early? I've been wondering that for years. What good does it do to get up early? Well, someone might say, but Brother Ray, remember the old adage, the early bird gets the worm. Well, what I figured out is the person who gets up early, when they get to the restaurant, they get the cook's best effort. Because their cook is not tired by the time the rest of the crowd gets there later in the day. So if you want the best food, you go early in the morning. That's not what he's saying. Is it? He's telling us that we need rest. That we must have it. And so therefore, those who trust in God, we can close our eyelids with the knowledge of God's blessings in peace. Notice what the wise man writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. What are you saying, Solomon? What are you, what are you trying to tell us in that voice? Is it what he's saying true? Those who are wealthy, those who are rich, what are they always trying to do? Get more. And in order to get more, what do they have to do? Don't they constantly have to stay busy? And because they constantly stay busy, their mind is preoccupied only with trying to gain more. And because they're so busy trying to gain more and more and more, their rest cannot be in peace. Brethren, I want us to realize, as we are children of God, as we are His children, we can rest assured that we can sleep, that we can rest in peace. You see, we can have, as Paul says, peace that passes all understanding. But look thirdly at the third verse, and notice that the third verse doesn't deal with rest anymore. The third verse is going to simply deal with that supplication or that request for God's guidance during the new day. <laughs> the first thing that you and I should do as we wake in the morning is to utter a prayer of thanksgiving to God, number one, for our night's rest, and number two, for the first breath that we're able to draw on the new dawning day. And that's what the third verse is trying to tell us. You see, the morning is the time when the sleeper watches and he waits to arise. Psalm 130 and verse 6 says, My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for morning. Yes, more than those who watch for morning. Isn't it a beautiful thing to wake up You've just experienced the beauty of God's creation, the handiwork of His creations as you laid down to rest. And when you wake up, guess what? The handiwork of God doesn't disappear. The morning is something you long for. What about a sunrise? Is there anything more beautiful than a sunrise? Other than maybe a sunset? Is that can you, can you really choose which one's more beautiful? No. Why? Because they both declare who God is. They both declare something old is going to pass and something new is going to come forth. That's what we see when we see this supplication for a new day. And so when you and I lie down with God's blessings, we can anticipate, we can look forward to <coughs> To being sustained until the morning when we rise again. Notice Psalm 3 and verse 5. It says, I, lie down and, I lay down and slept, 
I wait for the Lord to sustain me. <clears throat> Who is it that sustains us no matter what time of day it is? Who is it that grants us the ability to live? Isn't it God? Isn't God the sustainer of all life? Isn't He the sustainer of all things in our life? And so why would we think as we wake in the morning that He would not sustain us another day? But then the third thing that I see in this verse is as we get up with a pure, as we get up pure and fresh and sinless, we can look forward even more to that eternal morning of joy. Now you might think, Brother Ray, what do you mean we wake up pure and fresh? I get that. I, I, I see that we wake up pure, we wake up refreshed, but sinless. When we go to bed at night and we say our evening prayers, do we ask God for forgiveness for the sins that we've committed in a day? If we do, we go to bed pure, we rise to be new, sinless, living another day, in which we hope that we can go through without sin. But as we live our life, we know that we can look forward to that eternal morning. Isn't that what we're all striving for? Aren't we all trying to get there? Aren't we all longing for that eternal morning when the resurrection is going to come? And I realize that the resurrection of Jesus, the second coming, may not be in the morning, but it'll be like morning. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 30 in verse 5. It says his anger is for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Think about our children again. Think, think about yourself when you were a child. Was there ever a time when you went to bed disappointed and you were weeping and crying? And then when you woke the next day, all the things that happened the day before had been forgotten? That's what the song is talking about. Knowing that we have this ability to put the past behind us and look to the future. And so as I think of the song, Now the Day is Over, I already said this is a hymn that's been included in every songbook that I've looked at. It's important. The melody. If you go back and you look at the melody, it centers around one note. One note. But the harmony, and that ever-changing harmony, prevents monotony, if you will. And so when you take the melody and the harmony, they produce that soothing and peaceful effect. And so tonight as you go home and as you pillow your head in sleep, it is always good to know that God is with us now the day is over. Tonight we may have one in our midst who is not a member of the body of Christ, and you, through hearing the Word and developing faith in that Word, need to make your life right. You can come with a penitent heart, repenting of things in your life, determining to change the way you live, confessing the name of Jesus as the Son of the living God, and be immersed with Him in the watery grave of baptism. Your sins will be washed away, and I assure you that you'll sleep better tonight because you'll have peace of mind knowing that you are in a saved relationship with the God who created you. For tonight you may have done that and your life has not been what it should be and you've turned back to the way of the world and you need to come home tonight. And you need to experience that same thing you experienced when you were first baptized. You can come repenting of sin, confessing those sins. Will you let your brethren pray with you, pray for you? Why are we here? You remember our lesson this morning, we talked about bearing one another's burdens. Praying for one another is one of those ways that we can help bear a burden. No one 
that I know of that is here wants anyone to be lost. Our attitude is just that of God. We want all to come to repentance, that none should perish. Tonight, what's your need? Only you know, only you can make your need known by coming to the front as we stand. As we stand.